everybody. How's it going? Dan Schinder here on Yes Shift with... Steven Schinder. That's right. And our very special guest, first time hazing, I mean, first time guest, Kevin Godley. How are you? I'm very well. How are you guys? Very well. We are thrilled to have you on to talk about so many different things. And for, the, for those who may have lived under a rock for 50 years... Just going to skim the surface here. We're going to talk about the 50th anniversary of the first 10CC album. We're going to talk about not just landmark videos that you've done, Kevin, with Lowell, but landmark videos, period, in the music industry. About six for you, too. Um, uh, Phil Collins uh, from Tarzan, uh, that song, and of course, Peter Gabriel, Kate Bush, um, a, a flash in the pan band called the police with a very popular video synchronicity too and um five guys that we're very fond of yes and the iconic yes video leave it so we're really excited to talk to you about that and music your career and um yeah steve why don't you kick it off right so first off we were curious uh, what drew you to drumming way back in the day uh, because I was terrible as a guitar player, <laughs> I mean, all my all my pals back in the day, teenagers, we all wanted to be in bands. And, you know, it's, you're either the singer or the guitar player. Those are the kind of the main roles in a band back then in the early 1960s. The drummer was some guy that sat at the back. Um, but I was terrible. I tried bass guitar. I was terrible at bass guitar. I was equally terrible at just rhythm guitar. So lead guitar was way ahead of me. Um, but a friend of mine who was um, quite, was his father was very wealthy. And he was in one of the early groups that I was in. And his father bought him a drum kit. And he could not play it to save his life. So <laughs> one day I sat down behind the drum kit and picked up the sticks and found miraculously that I have that kind of independent suspension thing you need. Yeah. I sort of understood that unlike what most people think, you're not playing four different things at the same time. You're playing four parts of one thing. Right. And I understood that intrinsically. So I found that I could kind of play. So I moved backwards to the drum kit, essentially. Interesting. Who were some of your early influences as far as drummers? Oh, I never really took much notice. I mean, I, you know, before I actually started playing properly, I was into jazz. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people like Art Blakey and people like that. Oh, yeah. Influence. But they were, you know, they were soloists. Yeah. Jazz players were soloists and it was very subtle. I suppose my, my drum heroes of that period were the rhythm section for Motown records. The names escaped me, uh, but the simplicity of what they did was essentially, they were the engine that drove everything else. Um, and that what, that's what really impressed me. It, it was all about what you left out as opposed to what you put in. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I, was, I was trying to head in that direction. Less was more for me. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks for definitely. sharing that. Yeah. A, a little while ago, we got a message from Bernard Basso, who wanted us to give you his regards and worked oh. with you and Graham Goldman in a band called Mockingbirds back in mm. the 60s. Would you like to talk a bit about that era? Sure. The Mockingbirds were a sort of mixture of a, of a number of different bands. Graham had a band called The Whirlwinds. Mm. At the same time, I was in a band called The Sabres, and we used to rehearse in the same place, but they were kind of way ahead of us on the circuit. They were much more professional than we were. But they, they, we were playing sort of R&B cuts, and they were playing sort of, how can I describe it, more, oh, more grown-up music, or so they thought. There was more of a cabaret band. Mm. Uh, mm. So they were heading in a different direction to us, but... The whirlwinds broke up 
And round about that time, Graham was starting to have some success as a songwriter. And he started to put a new band together called the Mockingbirds, and he needed a drummer. So he sort of persuaded me to leave the Sabres and join the Mockingbirds, essentially. And we, we, the sort of standard of the gigs we played sort of went up a rung on the ladder. We previously played horrible little dives and shitholes around England. <laughs> and we had to set up our own equipment and, and all that. But now we were playing, you know, we were playing slightly better places like ice rinks. And, and uh, the biggest gig we ever had was, I think it was on a Monday evening, in a place called the CIS building, which was an insurance building. But they had a thing every Monday night where they had people come in and they had us and dancers and all sorts of things. And we would play sort of rare R&B cuts again but we'd also play some of graham's songs um and we recorded some of graham's songs but for the for the life of me i have no idea why but we couldn't get a hit off any of his songs his songs were always hits with other bands but never with us which was a real shame because it was a it was a tasty little band bernard basso on bass perfect name for a bass player then yeah <laughs> it worked out <laughs> yeah with myself on on drums and Stephen Jacobson on rhythm guitar and Graham on lead guitar and vocals so you know it was a, it was a nice tight little outfit but we just it just we just couldn't break through unfortunately and but I was I was sorry I was I was but I enjoyed doing it and it gave me a taste for it because mm. Time the Mockingbirds were operational, I was also at art college. So, you know, maybe two or three nights a week at art college, I'd pile into an old van and shoot off around the country playing gigs. And it was far more exciting than studying for a degree in graphic design. You know? Yeah. And then a few years later, it takes us to the very first uh, 10 CC album, which we're going to pull up here for people to. Can you believe that was 50 years ago? And did you ever think that people today would be looking back at it um, as they are today? Because it's still a very nicely revered album. It was. I, no, to answer the first part of your question, yeah. I have no idea, but none of us had an idea what we were doing at all except maybe except maybe eric stewart who had already had some success with the mind builders but but and graham of course as a writer but myself and Lord cream we were like this is brilliant what's going to happen next you yeah. know we, we just we just fell in and, and and enjoyed ourselves we were two sort of ex-art students looking for something to play with and we found something great um no, we, we have no idea. I mean, things moved very quickly in those days and disappeared very quickly in those days. Um, so at the very beginning, we had no idea. First off, we, we had a very small amount of time to record that album because I think we'd have one hit record at the time, which was Donna. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, they were pushing us to record an album. We hadn't actually written a great deal of material. So I think we both wrote and recorded everything in about three weeks, which was not a lot of time. Um, but it was an extraordinary three weeks because it taught me one very important thing is, is not to think too much. When you're making music, don't analyze it too much just let it come oh that's nice because, yeah so we did we just you know we didn't think oh well, yeah, that doesn't sound like we want it to do or that doesn't sound like the beatles so it can't be good enough mm -hmm. that went out the window we wrote we recorded it we didn't stop to think if it was any good it was only towards the end where we were listening back to that that we realized that what we were doing didn't really sound like anybody else at the time and really that's 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 what you should be aiming to achieve um because if you try to sound like other people you're wasting your time <laughs> yeah that's some great wisdom by the way for for newer songwriters and 
younger musicians and even older ones that are getting into recording and, and writing their music? It's inevitable, though. You know, when you, when you start to do something, you have uh, opinions about what good music is if you're a musician. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're nobody, when you're starting off, you sort, sort of inevitably lean towards making something that sounds a bit like the people you admire or has something of that quality. But it's, it's sort of a bit further down the road that you find out who you are. And it's not necessarily about thinking about what that is. It's about something inherent in your personality or how, it, how, how you function with the other people in the band. It just comes if you're lucky. And we, 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 we still don't know what it was, but whatever it was worked. Yeah, the opposite of manufactured music. Totally the opposite of manufacturing music. And I think that was that was partly because we weren't operating it out of London, which was the centre of the music business at the time in the UK. Mm -hmm. We were in a town outside Manchester and we had the only professional recording studio there. And therefore, um, the powers that be didn't come down to visit us and listen and critique uh, uh, until we said they could. It's not like we had what we transfer and we could send them anything. <laughs> no. That's brilliant. Yeah. Nice. So we were allowed to sort of run free and, and, and just uh, experiment and see what we could do. And thank goodness it worked. Yeah. I, I like what you said about not trying to sound like anyone because that kind of brings me to Godly and Cream, which was pretty different from. 10 cc uh, one of those albums the history of mix volume one utilized a very amazing idea of songs and demos you two had worked on together over the years and remixing them into something else so was there ever a volume two in mind or was volume one something you guys thought would be funny to include in the title there was we're talking about history mix yes there was, um there was a, a video version of the streams um, that may or may not be out there on YouTube or, or something. We, there wasn't enough material to do a convincing volume two of history mix, if you know what I mean. Mm. But what we did want to do was use the expertise that we'd learned by making music videos and apply that experience to the history mix idea. In other words, we would mix our visuals in mm. the same way that we mix the sound, um, which turned out rather well. Um, yeah. Other than Lol getting a kidney stone towards the end of those editing sessions. Oh, wow. Having to be, having to be carted off to hospital. And mm. Myself and my artist are having to finish it. <laughs> oh, which was, that was nightmarish. But yeah, we locked ourselves in a, in a video edit suite for about a week and did the same as we did with the audio, we did with the pictures. Okay. Uh, on that album, I thought it was brilliant how Wet Rubber Soup had a climactic ending uh, utilizing I'm Not In Love, which many people know very well still to this day and then the big yeah. boys don't cry bit segued into the song cry and trevor horn has said he hung out with you guys while he made the music video for uh, the police's synchronicity but of course he also worked with you guys on cry uh, can yeah. you tell us uh, about that process uh, working on that yes trevor and, and, and us we were we were both we were all in new york at the time we we were editing um a performance film um, a concert that we shot of the police um for the what was the album called i think it was the synchro was it the synchronicity album was that the title of their album at yes the time? yeah okay we filmed them live in concert and we were editing that in new york uh, and I can't remember what Trevor was doing in New York, but we were staying at the same hotel. And we'd meet up at night and we got to know each other and we, and we became friends. And naturally, we, we, we started talking about 
maybe when we get back to the UK, we could actually do something together. Um, and our first idea was to, didn't work out, but our first idea was to do something called Hit the Box, because one of the, one of the things we used to enjoy was going up to our room and turning on American television and flipping between all the different channels, mm. of which there are many in America. Mm. And we thought there was something interesting that, that could be done using that technique. But of course, we'd forgotten that in England, there were only three channels that existed. So it wasn't going to work out the way we originally thought. Once we'd sussed that it wasn't going to work out, we were left with some empty studio time uh, and trying to say, well, what else have you got? And we had the first verse of Cry, and we'd had the first verse of Cry for 15 years. We'd never been able to take that song any further. Uh, don't ask me why, but that's that was the case. So we played in the Interesting. first verse of Cry. And he said, that's brilliant. Just let's load that into the Synclavia and let's see what we can do. Why don't you and Lol go off and play table tennis for half an hour and we'll see what we can cook up, which is exactly what happened. They um, we got to work with, I think it was JJ at the time. And so we played table tennis for probably an hour and came back and then we had this wonderful loping backing track which was gorgeous um, and there wasn't a great deal to add to that in terms of instrumentation but I had to go in and sing what little lyrics we had and sort of improvise throughout the song until we found bits that fitted to this new backing track um, and then Lol played some lovely liquid guitar over the top excuse me and that was it Interesting. We, by the way, have a question from Bob Kessler, who says, I'd want to know more about the Godly and Cream album, Goodbye Blue Sky, since I am a yeah. harmonica player. How did that idea come about? How did they record? How did you <laughs> uh, record? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. How did they get to the record label to sign off on an idea that was unique and not at all following any clear musical trend at the time? and that were and what were your thoughts about how it turned out i think by the time we got to record goodbye blue sky a number of things had happened they would we'd had a little bit of success we'd had a couple of hit singles by them as god and cream but we'd become a little tired of working with electronics and we were kind of yearning to play again you know, those first albums like L and Freeze Frame and so on and so forth turned out really well, but I was increasingly sort of being drawn to Lynn drum machines and, and drum pads and, and logs drawn to sequencing and so on and so forth. But we, we, we got bored very quickly in those days and we thought it would be very good and rather interesting to go backwards to uh, to work with musicians again <laughs> with other people so you know i got the drums out again and we played stuff and we thought we both loved the, the sound of a harmonica and we and we investigated what other kinds of harmonicas could do bass harmonica for instance and there's loads of different harmonicas. And we thought that if that was a component of this kind of music that was coming out, mm -hmm. it would have a very, I wouldn't say gentle sound, but it would have a different sound, but a sort, sort of bluesy approach and a sort of more organic approach, mm -hmm. um, along with three backing singers. I think we were after something a bit more soulful um, at the time. And around about that time, I had also become a member of an environmental pressure group called ARC. 
So I was, along with people like Chrissy Hyman and the McCartneys, I was, I was becoming aware of stuff like that. And the lyrics that I was coming up with at the time was sort of heading in that direction, which seemed partially to fit with the, the sound we were making. And we had a great time making that record. We were working with people we'd not worked with before. And it was a joy just to be able to do that again, as opposed to just the two of us sitting there programming shit. Right. Which is, which is fine, but I mean, you know, it's a lonely way of making records. <laughs> yeah. Do you still have your Lindrum machine? No. Now, you know, I was in, um, I remember when those came out, those big things. And my wife and I were in Japan uh, three years ago, three years ago, right now, actually. And we were in uh, the Kochi Prefecture, which is a very rural ag agricultural area. And we went to this uh, museum of art, but it also had um, all sorts of old communication devices and old uh, like Game Boys and Nintendo. And then there was a Lindrum, and I said, oh, I know what that is. It looks so out of place amongst all these old phones and pinball machines and yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. It was really weird. Yeah. I mean, it was a great invention. It really was a great invention. Yeah. And then you could put it down, and it'd be shit, and then you could quantize it, and it'd be perfect. I mean, it was, it was an extraordinary piece of equipment. It just, I just wanted to play a role every now and again, you know, a drum fill. It wasn't going to let me do that. But I mean, the, the notion of it, the, the idea of it is still very dominant in today's recording anyway. It's just done in a slightly different way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one of the songs on the Godway and Cream album, Birds of Prey, titled My Body the Car, kind of reminded me of Yes's Leave It because of the scat singing and stuff like that. Uh, and you guys would work on the music videos for Leave It. Do you think that... Um, my body, the car may have had some sort of influence on yes in a way. I know the chronology is pretty close together. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm no idea. I've no idea. I mean, the idea behind my body, the car was to find out if we could record something just using vocals, right? To, with the impression of other instruments. Um, and I think you know, one of the things we had in mind was. Although it's nothing like that. I mean, there's Lambert Hendrickson Ross from the jazz period prior to our golden years. Uh, that kind of jazz singing, um, but it took everything a stage further. No, I've no idea if it had an influence on yes at all. Mm. You think it did? Mm, I suppose it might be possible, at least a little bit, but I guess we'd have to ask them, you know? Yeah, maybe we'll ask Trevor that if we have him yeah. on about his new solo album. That would be really interesting. Um, and yeah. how familiar were you with um, Yes Before You and Cream directed the Leave It video, which is, again, it's an iconic video as far as music videos go. Um, and, oh. and how did that collaboration come together? How did that go? Oh, gosh. Yeah, of course we were aware of Yes, um, but I don't think we were huge fans of Yes. It was a sort of off to progressive, like prog, as they call it now. Right. We weren't huge fans, but we were, we were aware that there were, there were great players. And that in this particular case, they were after doing something a little bit different, um, which is why they hooked up with us. I don't think they were quite prepared for how different our ideas were going to be. Uh, but I do remember having a phone call with Chris Squire when I was in the bath trying to explain the idea to him of what we intended to do. You do know that there was more than one video, yeah? Yeah, I think I read somewhere there might have been 18 or may maybe a little less. I'm not quite sure at the moment. But yeah, there are many versions of that. So the theory behind it was instead of doing one video with lots of cuts, we do 18 videos with no cuts. Mm. 
Mm. Which sounds which sounds insane, but at that time we were very keen on disrupting anything to do with MTV and disrupting anything to do with normality of MTV and what you might expect on MTV. We like to surprise people, and we thought this would be very interesting. So that's what we actually did. It was it was a very simple shoot. We just had them, you know, with their backs to the camera. We had them doing this, that, and the other, but all the different pieces, all the different films, they were upside down in every single one. Yeah. And the thing I remember most about that shoot was I think the last, the last one we did was where they had their backs to camera. So, you know, we cued sound and we cued camera and we said action. And then everybody in the studio split. We all left the studio. Oh, wow. They didn't know because they had their backs to us. <laughs> so what tended to happen with all the other takes is when the music finished, everyone would applaud. And the music finished and there was no one there. When they <laughs> <laughs> That's it funny. Priceless. Do you have a favorite version, Kevin? I think that the one that we were the one that we were persuaded to do, which was kind of like the official version of it, which which combined all the different ones in quite a complex piece of work, is is my favourite. It's mm. it's we actually put our editor through some very painful moments in that because <laughs> it was bending technology that wasn't meant to do any of that into shape. But yes, that one. The sort of penultimate, the ultimate rather version of, of Leave It. Nice. And you're right. It does sound, for someone, I've been doing video production for about 23 years, and it does sound insane to make 18 versions from that one shoot, but also quite a feat. Going through that process, did you find that pushing those limits helped you discover new possibilities that you would carry forward into your video production work? Well, it taught us one thing that, that it taught us, I, mean, I think we knew it already at this particular period of time, that in the music video industry that had become mm -hmm. an interesting industry then, that the lunatics ran the asylum. Because even though, you know, the sort of money people and the and the marketing people and so on and so forth at record labels were gradually getting their heads around what video could do and what it was for. It was really all about the directors in, in those days. Um, it was finding the right director for the right act and letting them run free because what was exciting about MTV was seeing new things. It was MTV was like a gallery for all these experimental filmmakers of the period. And we were allowed pretty much to do what we wanted to do. Right. That's what we learned. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens, the opposite is, is never very far away. And it began gradually to slip away from the lunatics and back to the doctors and the analysts and the money people in sort of early to mid 90s when they figured out that this ad artist cannot have a black and white video you can't do that with this artist you have to do this it it sort of got to that stage is what we we really want to do something really edgy mm -hmm. but if you can make it as as close as possible to the last hit they had that would be really great and also if we could film it somewhere where we haven't been yet. You know, that, that kind of attitude was uh, began to be dominant. Nice. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And it's another uh, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, um, we have a comment from Joshua VP who says good evening chaps greetings from Belgium. Hey, Josh. Uh, how was the experience with the police music videos? And thank you for the music and drumming. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate you saying that. Um, they were great to work with. They were fantastic. Um, we were on the same page 
uh, we were we were kind of growing growing with them as they were growing in stature as a band. Mm. A concert film that I mentioned before, we filmed twice, once in a small club in Toronto, and then a few months later in a stadium somewhere in America, which would give you some idea of how they've jumped, of how they've grown as a band and their popularity had grown. They were a very smart bunch of guys. They instinctively understood that the ideas we were presenting to them connected with where they were headed and what the music was about. And I think it's important to say that one of the reasons I think we were successful as directors in that period of time was because we were musicians. Mm -hmm. At the very beginning of, of the music video explosion, most of the people directing music videos came from television or they were documentary makers or they were making commercials. They didn't necessarily have a feel for music, if you know what I mean. And, and a musician talking to a musician about imagery seemed to be a very, a very positive element. I think at the time, and we really, I think we really moved ahead because of that. They felt more comfortable with us than with an ex-documentary director or a TV director or a drama director. Right. It's a different, it's a different medium. It's a different idiom. Absolutely. Plus, I know as an editor and having been a drummer for 54 years, there's a sense of timing that goes with video editing, whether it's how you cut and when you cut from one camera to the next, just mm -hmm. matching up audio tracks. There's, there's a lot of, I think, innate skills we have as drummers when it comes to timing that comes in handy in some peripheral things than just playing at the kit. Definitely. I mean, looking back on films that were music films that were made before the video explosion, I'm, I'm looking at the drummer and his his stick is hitting a cymbal when I'm hearing a snare. You know? Yeah, exactly. Or the hi-hat and he's on the ride. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that was always very, very um, helpful to come from music and be, be able to edit music, which was hugely beneficial. Yeah. One so. of my biggest, uh, one of my favorite concert films has some of the biggest, I'll call them errors in the editing. And that is the song remains the same. There's, there's some cuts where literally within the same song, John Paul Jones is wearing a different outfit. It's like, come on. I mean, it doesn't take a musician <laughs> to get that one. You know what I mean? It's just a, unbelievable. But uh, because it's Led Zeppelin and I love the music, it's still one of my two favorite concert films. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody obviously didn't tell somebody that, you know, you'd be, you'd be filming on three nights and it would, might be a good idea. <laughs> to wear the same thing. Continuity, does that word mean anything? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or, or maybe the. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's, it doesn't matter in the end. I mean, you love it, right? So it's even with its faults, sometimes, sometimes faults are the best thing about it. Mm. I agree. Yeah. I, I was just about to say maybe they want to insinuate that he had like some magical power that allows him to change clothes at super <laughs> shapeshifter, but only on the clothing. probably not, but you know, <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> I don't think that would work. Right. Not um, anyway, right. <laughs> yeah. A another music video you co-directed was real love back in the 1990s. Uh, funny enough, there would also be a yes song with that same title. Uh, but Real Love was essentially a John Lennon song that posthumously had his Beatles bandmates added onto it for Anthology 2. Can you tell us about the experience working on that particular video? Yeah, that, that was not a Godly and Cream video. No, oh, right. That was a, a song. We, we'd sort of parted by then. Mm. Uh, and this, this, this was... Um, one of the videos I, I did as a solo project. Ah. Um, an honor to, to do it. I got a call from Paul. We, we lived quite close to Paul at the time. And he asked if I'd be interested in doing 
a Beatles song, a new Beatles song. So I thought about it for about two bars and said yes. Um, and they were after something a bit more real, a bit more to do with them and the, and the sessions that had taken place to, I forget what the project was called. They did a big project at this time, which was like a series. Um, it'll come to me or it'll come to you. Um, um, and there was a load of footage of them in the studio and there was a load of vintage footage of them, obviously, and I had access to all of that. Um, but I felt that I, there was glue needed to, to put it all together that was more beatly, for want of a better word. So I had this idea of, first idea was um, a reverse shot of John's white piano rising out of the Mersey but also other shots of the Sergeant Pepper costumes floating through frame. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things like that, so, sort of punctuation marks from their visual history, if, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and also to, to film each of them um, smiling in super slow motion, the way Yoko Ono smile film, I think the film's called Smile, that she made of John doing the same thing, was to duplicate each of them doing the same thing. So there was, there was some kind of things from the past and the present that kind of joined everything together. And other than that, it was just a matter of shooting everything and picking and choosing um, in great detail the correct shots to use to make the whole thing work. Um, my my abiding memory though of the process is sort of a slightly embarrassing one because the mix we were given to cut the video to was a very rough mix and I don't know whether it was intentional or not but the vocals were very low in the mix. Oh, that's interesting. I think it may have be may have been because if it ever got out it would be a shit mix and they wouldn't be able to hear it properly. Hmm. But, I, you know, when I'm working, when I'm editing, I like to hear what I'm editing to. I like to know what I'm trying to give an impression of. Yeah. So I couldn't. So what I did was I went into a, a recording studio with the rough mix and, and sang the song on top of it myself. Oh. So at least I knew what the song was. Yeah. And then we put on editing. But it did get out with my voice on it. So somewhere out there in the internet, on the internet, is a version of Real Love with me singing along. How interesting. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing the things that come out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Extraordinary, I'm sort of crippled with embarrassment. Um, hmm. But it was just, a, it was a workaround. It was essentially something I did so we could hear what the song was because we couldn't that well hear it at the time. That's right. funny. We saw that you directed uh, You'll Still Be In My Heart from the Tarzan movie with Phil Collins, of course, singing. And that movie was actually Stephen's introduction to Phil Collins. Um, what was that process like? And what are some of the key things that have really sort of progressed or changed in video production since then? Is it more the software and the equipment? Is it more stylistically? Is it both and something else? Everything. It's everything. I think probably the most significant thing that happened was the switch uh, from analog editing to nonlinear digital editing. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff that Godley and Cream did back in the day had different layers of stuff going on. I mean, a good example of that would be Set Them Free by Sting, where we had a number of different participants mm -hmm. playing, singing, but we treated each layer differently. But the problem was in those days, when you layer things up, Every time you layer, you lose quality. Mm -hmm. 
it's like it's like mixing down onto one track seven tracks that you've recorded in audio you lose quality yeah once once digital non-linear editing came into being that all went out the window so you could do as many layers as you like and not lose any quality ever but strangely the thing that did change along with that was the amount of time you took to create an edit because it meant that you can do anything now right so you'd you interesting it's there you can trade off it. you can have 10 layers of this and so and that's the case now we used to edit a video in in a day mostly oh, wow. did. it may have been 24 hours in a day but it was a day yeah now it's three days interesting that's, that's, but also the, the the technology changed as well in terms of the hardware changed as well it had to to keep up um and thank goodness it did everything changed everything changed yeah. now most film or things you see that you think of film most of them are shot on digital video these days because they managed to figure out a way for video not to look like video mm -hmm. like film. yeah that's interesting make it look like film yeah yeah I'm going to read a couple comments uh, real quick. One of them from Taylor Baum says, uh, please ask about the status of uh, Kevin's Orson Welles movie project, The Gate. Uh, so do you have any update on that? Nothing specifically. I've got it. Okay, so that was sort of just about to go into early pre-production when COVID Hit. Oh wow! Mm. And everything fell apart. You know, right. movies were being made, and we didn't we didn't get to make the film. Um, I've done a number of rewrites since then, and it is with a couple of people at the moment. So I hope to be able to make it at some point, because Orson Welles never goes out of fashion. It's not it's not a Marvel film. It's a serious film about Orson Welles, so mm. I live in hope. Um, but I've got some other projects, film projects on the go as well at the same time. So that is an ambition. I would like to direct a feature at some point. Better be soon. Right. Yeah, and uh, this other comment from Ivan Adcock says, Bonafide legend randomly popping up on my phone. So that's referring to you, Kevin. Uh, what does <laughs> what does Kevin think of consequences now? Uh, that's from Godly and Cream. Uh, would he still spend six months on one track? Uh, does he wish Honolulu Lulu got more recognition as a fine piece of music? Interesting questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, the sort of overall answer is it was Godly and Cream's grand folly if you like. It was our Heaven's Gate. Um, but it was still, I mean, Heaven's Gate is actually a good picture if you if you go and watch it today. Um, but we were we were out of time, I think. Oh. In two senses. We were we were doing the wrong thing at the wrong time because we were probably the last people trying to do a grand opus and meister work. Mm. at the time when New Wave and Punk was knocking down all the walls and everything was going in the complete opposite direction and we didn't actually notice for a while because we were holed up in a studio for 14 months mm. tiddling away on things that lasted for a second yeah you came out and there was a different music scene right like a whole new well, we were genre the, you know we were the Japanese soldier at the end of the war lost in the forest you know we were him and it was like, what the hell is going on? Not quite that, not quite like that, but that, there was no way of stopping what we'd started. There was no way of turning it around. It was what it was. And I'm, I'm proud of some of the music that we, that we did. I'm not wild about Peter Cook's play part of it. Mm. I don't think that really worked. And I think it was a, a sort of last ditch desperate effort by the record company to turn it into something 
else that it was never meant to be. And they thought that Peter Cook was more of an adult than we were. Boy, were they wrong. Interesting. That brings yeah. us to muscle memory. From a few years ago uh, came the use of remote work that a lot of us are now familiar with, of course. Yeah. How would you say that that, you know, other than the obvious, Kevin, how would you say that that differs from collaborating with someone in person? Um, were there benefits as well as the challenges to that? And do you have a preference? Because I could think of some people I'd rather work remotely with and some people <laughs> I'd rather work in person. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to make coffee for them every 10 minutes for a start, you know. You don't have to feed them. You don't have to argue with them. Right. <laughs> first, first off, the, the reason I went down that road was because I don't play an instrument. But and so I, I am essentially a, a reactive writer. You know, when I sit with somebody, they'll be playing an instrument, and I'll have a notebook and I'll be singing. So I react to chords, I react to rhythms. I didn't have that. How am I going to write a song? I mean, I'm a drummer, I'm not the ideal instrument to write songs to. So I figured if I could get people to send me pieces of music, instrumental pieces of music, either stuff they already had or or would create that they thought I might like to work on, then maybe I could find some things to create songs with. And that's pretty much what happened. Um, it was just, I, I wasn't expecting to get as many pieces of music as I did. I got loads. I was expecting to get what, maybe 50 or something. I got something like mm -hmm. 200 or something insane like that and so i have to be fair to everybody i have to listen to every piece of music that i got and I, I developed a skill of understanding quite quickly whether i could do something with with this piece of music or not and i gradually sort of whittled them down uh, and then tried a bit harder on certain things and oh that's going to work we'll definitely do that that sounds great but i can't do anything for that so that goes off to one side and it's, it was quite a, a long process but but I found it incredibly satisfying for for the simple reason when when you sat down opposite someone writing you haven't got a full set of sounds you've got like a piano or you've got a guitar right. you haven't got something that sounds halfway three quarters of the way towards a fully produced piece of music and that was incredibly helpful because when I when I'm singing something that doesn't exist and I'm searching for a key or a way into this track, I'm 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 looking, I'm singing as if I'm singing something that exists. Mm -hmm. I all do that when we're writing music, but it doesn't exist. So you're jabbering and you're mumbling, but it's easier to jabble and mumble something slightly better and more formed when you sing into something that sounds like a full piece of music so i found that very satisfying it was it was it was great and it was also when i'd actually taken a track to or taken it far enough to know that it was going to work i would do a rough mix and then send it to to my collaborator to get their input and i, I was lucky enough and they said it's most of them said it's fantastic just carry on so there was never any toing and froing, and I made a decision quite early on, except in one case, not to mess with the structure of everything, just to keep everything the way it was sent to me. And also I made a decision not to reveal to anybody online who I was collaborating with because at that time I didn't know who I'd be collaborating with, but I thought maybe I'd get some pieces from somebody who was well known or somebody who was up and coming or somebody who was, you know, a legacy person. Yeah. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I wanted to be fair. I wanted the thing to be driven by the quality of the music that was being sent, not the name, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so I didn't do many bulletins, uh, you know, out there about where I was at. I just did it and, and sort of handed it into the label, and they were very, very pleased. It worked. It worked well. 
Nice. Yeah. You know, I have to, Steve, I'm going to jump in and show everybody, I'm sorry, just real quick, the album cover again, because I have a question about it. The yeah. pill there, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, with Sefton, I believe, there you go. And it, it's used, that pill is used for bladder infection, bacterial infection, bronchitis, bone infection, and pneumonia, which is the reference here for the album cover? Anything? I probably had all three when I was recording it. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Funny, um, funny. Look, I mean, all the, all the, all the, the images in, in the album, there was, there was a little book, booklet with the full sleeve. Um, I made all the images and I did all the graphics. Um, that actually looks a little bit... Not very yep, much, there it is. Like I used to look like when I was at school. Um, it's a neat just, cover. Yeah, thanks. But it's just the things I collected um, over the years. The lips, the lips on that. Yeah. Were a stain. Right. On the floor. So that's not manipulated in any way. It's just, again, something that I found and photographed. Very cool. Yeah, Muscle Memory is a very thought-provoking album. E even a while after listening to it, I found myself thinking back to what it touches on. You know, it felt very now a few years ago and still feels very relevant today as you bring up stuff like people being stuck on screens, yeah. uh, co companies figuring out a balance when it comes to branding, and the whole thing about having followers and people honing in on favorite artists and favorite songs. I love the lyrics about how one's only follower being their shadow. Yeah. Uh, how, how easily did the lyrics come to you while making this album? Easier than I thought. Mm. Oh, really? <laughs> I it was, almost went over a dog's was, tail, was, sorry. <laughs> what was that? One of your nuts fell out the bottom of your trousers. <laughs> <laughs> no, He's I almost ran over a dog's tail. I had to dog, move her, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I th yeah it, it, was, it was just prior to COVID kicking in. Um, and some of the album, and it, I think sh the, the sort of fiasco that happened at Charlottesville had happened at the time. So mm. there were a number of things kicking off mm. at that time that sort of fed into the way I was thinking. And the sort of subject matter, I mean, it tracks like All, All Bones Are White and, and particularly a track called One Day. It was very prescient in terms of artificial intelligence uh, and so forth. I didn't, I wasn't aware of it, but I could feel, feel it coming. It was, it was almost inevitable. So, it was it was less about finding the subject matter it was again it was like finding the key that would make that subject matter work for for this particular song and there were times when i would try a particular idea for a lyric with this track and it didn't work so i shifted it <laughs> and tried the same notion of the lyric on a different piece of music and it would work i had that luxury um, which you don't usually get when you're writing for people. I had, you know, a bunch of tracks that I could go to that sounded really good, that I could try things on. And when they worked, I would continue taking it along that road. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was, even though it was a kind of a lonely pursuit, uh, and I'd probably be working mostly at night in the, in this room, I would I would be doing it. I would be recording on GarageBand, um, and all I'd be recording would be vocals. I'd, mm. I'd bring the track in, put it on a track on GarageBand, and just sing. And then, um, when it came time to to mix it, I just send all the stems to my engineer, and off we'd go, and we mix it in a better a better environment. We'd, with more up-to-date and more refined um, hardware. So it was, it was in a, in a way it was quite simple, but it was, it was refreshing for me to do it on my own because I had never done that before. I'd never done anything on my own before, musically. 
So there was nobody there to say I couldn't do that yeah. or I shouldn't do that. Um, yeah. So I, again, I just I just followed the feelings I had and, and, and with respect to, to, to what was taking place in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. I think I was, you know, I was being too pretentious. Um, but just feeling my way through it. And I didn't really know if everything would weave together well until we started. Well, quite good, isn't it? Interesting. <laughs> until, we, until we began to create this, uh, a track listing and how they would fit together. But, but they did. They did seem to fit together in, in a strange way. Yeah. Um, Very interesting. If you were to share your like playlist of some of your favorite stuff to listen to what would some of that be that someone would discover or rediscover that they might not be familiar with you, you mean the master yeah the the stuff you like to listen to when you just put on music if you do that <laughs> i don't as a matter of fact yeah i was gonna say not everybody does yeah oh i don't and I used to, but I don't anymore because I value silence. Mm. Increasingly, I go out and I can't, you know, I go into a restaurant or, or a shop and I get in a cab and there's music playing all the time. Yeah. It's it's like, just shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're You're inundated right. with it, right? Yeah. But it's the same. That, 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 that is the modern world. You're assailed by information constantly yeah and your mind your mind can overload on it. so i just make a concerted effort i don't i never sit down to listen to music unless it's for a project or unless it's something i'm really keen on listening to or it's a mix i've just done or something then then there's a purpose to it but just listening to music aimlessly yeah to fill a sort of vacuum is, is not something i do anymore so what would that next project be for Kevin Codley? Do you know yet? I'm working with, uh, I don't want to say too much about it yet, but I'm working with a classical composer mm. uh, based in mm. New York. Uh, we're coming up with some really interesting stuff. Um, what else am I doing? I've been making some, some art, for want of a better word, very pretentious art which I call Corrupted Files, which is basically, um, how can I describe it? It was, it was based on a series of accidents that, that happened when I was in the middle of editing a music video a good few years ago now, and I couldn't attend the final edit session for some reason. So it was all effects and overdubs and post-production things. So I had the post house send me the finished cut um, via whatever the technology was in mm -hmm. those days. And it got corrupted on its way to me. And I had to sign off on the cut so they could send it to the label, you know. I couldn't sign off on it because it was a fucking mess. Oh, so wow. They asked them to send it again. But while I was waiting for them to send it again, I looked through the mess. And every four or five frames was an extraordinary piece of digital art. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, this is really interesting. So I found a way of, of, of making that happen to an order. I had somebody build me a small piece of software. And I can now take anything I've shot and run it through this thing and create extraordinary pieces of digital art from stuff that I've shot. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, my intent is, is to exhibit them uh, at some point and sell them as prints, but one-offs um, at some point. That's one thing I'm doing. Um, I'm involved with the video games company. Um, oh, wow. Which should be interesting. That's always interested me. Nice. Um, I think for some reason I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to, whatever abilities that I have, I'm able, I'm able to translate them 
in different idioms for some reason, which I, I love I love doing that. It's great for Yeah. Me. That's great. Yeah. It's great. So I'm sort of I've got my feet in lots of different areas at the moment. I'm thinking of ideas for um for musicals, for plays, for films, for TV shows. Oh, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not boasting. I mean, all I'm saying is that I no, enjoy, you stay busy. Yeah, I, I enjoy the process of the creative process um, in different different levels. Yep, not I, just in one area. Yeah, not many people do that. I mean, Dave Stewart is like that. He loves. He loves flitting from one thing to another and somersaulting and, and <laughs> you know, leapfrogging from sound to video and, 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 and back and film. It's it's amazing to be able to do that. And I'm lucky enough to never being as busy as I am now. It's madness. But it's I love it. <laughs> That's, That's great though. Great. I love That's it. That's great. I'm well, sorry I'm blinking a lot. It's just that I've been sat in front of the screen editing stuff for the last few days. And oh, yeah, that can burn your retinas out and, for sure. It really does my eyes. And, yeah. There's a couple comments we'll read before we go. Um, let's see. Let me zoom in a bit here. Uh, Ivan Adcock says, wow, thanks, guys. That was a massive moment for me. Um, this was a little while back, about... 15 minutes ago. Yeah, when uh, we read his previous comments. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> Roger Nielsen says, um, hello from California. Kevin Godley Hi. is a legend in all caps. You got all caps. That's a biggie right there. That's, that's better that's than a good. Grammy. Yeah, it's <laughs> better than a Grammy. I like that. Legend. I think we pronounce it legend here, which is a whole different ballgame. But legend is acceptable. Yeah, and here's a question <laughs> from... Uh, Rainer Freeland, if I'm pronouncing that right, I hope, he asks, is Kevin aware that a Dutch band called Flat Earth Society made a cover of foreign accents? Are you familiar with that? No. Oh, stay, so when we say goodbye to the audience, stay on the line with us for a moment, and I'll grab the link that he put in, and I'll put it in the chat so you can copy it and oh. check it out later. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. Is it any good, Rainer? Well, I would think it would be. I mean, you could cover that song, and it would suck and still be good, because the song is so good. <laughs> yeah, and Rainer is tuning in all the way from Finland, uh, says a huge fan of 10cc and Godly and Cream, and yes, as well. So thank you for tuning in. Yeah. My My Very pleasure. cool. Yeah, thank you so much for taking time with us, Kevin. Anytime you have something you want to promote or talk about, please reach out. We would love to have you on again. And for everybody watching, thank you so much for joining Kevin Godley and Stephen and myself here on Yes Shift, also being simulcast on Drum Talk TV. And you can send in ideas, questions, comments to yesshiftpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash yes shift, youtube.com slash at yes shift, and at anchor.fm slash yes shift. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you all soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.